pick which topic to talk about today because it's we can do uh, you know, Parsha Tezino, we can do Yom Kippur, we can do Slichot. But I want to begin with something that I think will tie them all together and also current events. What I like to call, I call it the blame game. You know what that means, the blame game? If you listen to the news, that's all you hear about. When something goes wrong, you blame somebody else. Which sometimes might even be true. But if, if, you, if someone asked you, um, have you heard of Shirat Tazinu? You'd all tell me yes. But if you ask someone, what's the topic of Shirat Tazinu? When you study Shirat Tazinu, yeah, we know that definitely the first three aliyot we know be hard because we do it you know, every Monday and Thursday and usually it's two weeks. Uh, we know the song very well, but does the song have a topic? Shirat Hayam, the song of the sea that has a topic, thanking God for Kriyat Yamsuf. But if someone asked you, what's the topic of um, Shirat Hazino? Could anyone answer that? Evidence. Yeah, uh, Phil? It's, Phil, go ahead. I said it's evidence. Evidence? Evidence that Moshe told the people and he warned us. Huh? And, and where did he warn you? I mean, all the tochachot is the same thing, isn't it? All the tochachot, God warns us, if we keep his laws, we'll be good. If we don't keep his laws, he'll punish us. Sh Shira Tezinu has an introduction, which we read uh, in Parshat Ve'elech. I'll share my screen quickly. It's, pr it's pretty simple. And again, it's not the main topic today, just a way of introduction until everyone gets online. Uh, what I want to show you in Shira Tezinu, Shira Tezinu has one main topic. When something goes wrong, don't blame God, blame yourselves. Got that? And, and I want to explain the vicious cycle of what goes wrong. The application to modern day topics that you can do on your own. I just want to share my screen real fast and we're going to go to um, open up our Chomesh quickly. Uh, we'll go to part, chapter 31 in Sefer Devarim. If you have the Chomesh with you, it's better. But if not, we'll share the screen. In Paraklam and Aleph in Sefer Devarim in chapter 31, Right at the end of the parsha, there's a sort of a huddle between God and Moshe and Yeshua. But God tells Moshe something nice and simple. Pasik Tetzayin, and this relates to Chod Shuva that the Rambam quotes. God tells Moshe, you're going to die soon. I'll follow the Rambam. This doesn't mean it will happen. It's bound to happen. When the people come in the land, they're bound to go astray and follow the gods of the land. Who are the gods of the land? They're going to serve a rain god. They're going to serve a you know, fertility god. There's Baal, there's Asherah. All the Canaanite gods had a lot of logic because people need food to survive. So in the desert, you needed mana and you needed water to survive. Who supplied you with that? The god who took you out of Egypt. So of course, you followed your god in the desert as much as you could. But now that you're coming into the land of Israel, you don't need God in a miraculous way, the way you did in the desert, but you do need rain, you do need fertility, you need your crops to grow, you need good weather, and therefore you turn to the natural gods called the Canaanite gods. And the, the local people of the land had different customs of what we do to get rain, and the prayer is you're going to follow them instead of following God. So that's bound to happen. And then they're going to abandon me and break my covenant that I made with them. That's the covenant of Harsinah. Now, what I want to do in the share today, the reason I'm using this as an introduction, what I want to claim is that Yom Kippur is a type of a celebration of our covenant at Har Sinai. But not the first version that we sort of commemorate on Shavuot, but the second version, the second Luchot. Or in essence, Yom Kippur is a, commem as a we're commemorating what happened with the second Luchot. Not just the fact that God has attributes of mercy, but the whole context of what the second Luchot are about and what does it mean to have a brit, a covenant between God and the people. So what's God's fear? In the desert, you understood God, you followed God, at least to the best of your ability. The fear is once you come to the land of Israel, you're going to leave God. And there's logical reasons for that happening uh, because of the need to follow the gods of Canaan, which are the gods of nature, because you need rain and... Um, you need rain, you need crops, you need food, and you need to stay alive. 
and that will cause him to break my covenant. No. What will happen? Should we break God's covenant, which we're going to return to and understand in a minute, what does God threaten? If you don't follow my laws properly and don't follow my covenant from Har Sinai, I'll have to punish you. So I'll have to get angry and I'll have to leave them. I won't help them anymore. Be stuck to Panay Mehem, which means we'll see later on. I'm not going to listen to their prayers. I'm not going to answer the calls for help. They'll be eaten up by their enemies. Terrible things and calamities will happen to them. And Saurus. See, there's Yiddish and Chumash. This Pasuk is key. What are the people going to say when all these bad things happen? They're going to blame God for the trouble. That was my introduction. Almost all the Parshim explained the way I'm explaining now. And it makes sense based on the continuation in the context. What's going to happen? We're going to follow the gods of Canaan. We're going to follow, again, those gods of nature. So we'll see what's so bad about the, the other gods. But you're going to follow those gods. You won't follow the God who took you out of Egypt. You won't follow your God. I'll have to punish you. And when I punish you, I'm going to hold back. I'll hold back the rain, like we said in Shema and Ota You have trouble. You have sickness. You have wars and things like that. And then what's going to happen? When things go bad, you're going to say, hey, our God's not helping us. Where's the God of Israel? The God who's supposed to protect us. And more than that, when even when you turn to me for help, I'm not going to help you even if you turn to me. I'll call Rashi Asaki Panal Macharim because you turn to We say it in um, the David Hashem Ori every morning. Remember? Shema Hashem Kuli Akra, Choneni Vaneni. Let's answer my prayers. I have a problem. Bring a pasuk from Naftara from um. Ken. Rav Menachem, Rav Menachem, Rav Shniyachad. internet, and all of you are missing. As you take it into account, when time we can continue, but there was a delay of two seconds. From the other side, was it? Yes, yes. Okay, so tell me if it's coming again. Now it's coming. זה חזר, אבל תמונה היא קפואה. אני הייתי מציע, תפסיק את הוידאו. רגע, רגע, בוא נבדוק. תפסיק את הוידאו, תפסיק וידאו. רגע, 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 האמת היא, את צודק. אני עכשיו, רגע, עכשיו זה חזר. היה, היה, היה ניתוק חשמל, רגע. אני אמרתי שעכשיו זה חזר. עכשיו אני מחובר דרך הקו. לא חושב שזה בגלל זה. טוב, בוא נמשיך, אבל אני ארשה לעצמי להפסיק אותך אם יהיה משהו. רגע, 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 התמונה לא... איך התמונה... עכשיו? תמונה קצר. אני חוזר עכשיו לשיתוף של המסך. I'll go back to screen share. I'm going to do a quick little summary. All I want to claim was, Shira Tazinu, which is this week's Parsha, is coming to deal with the problem of who we're going to blame when things go wrong. And, God's, and God chose us for a reason. He wants a nation that's going to be his model nation, to represent God, to represent God among the nations. And therefore, if we follow God's laws properly and build a just society, God will reward us. If we're not fulfilling that goal, he'll have to punish us until we wake up. Now, if we don't follow his laws properly and, and don't follow the mitzvot, he'll have to punish us. When he punishes us, there's the threat that we're going to say that, hey, Things are so bad, why follow this God? He doesn't help us. Because what's God warned? Even if you turn to me in prayer, I'm not going to answer you unless you're keeping my mitzvot. I, I want to clarify this because it's the key difference between idol worship and worshiping God. Let me, I'll stop this share for a minute and we'll turn to the screen in a minute. If you follow Chumash, Chumash is really down on idol worship. It's like the first, in the first commandment, in the Ten Commandments, in the, in the first you know, opening statement of the Ten Commandments, it talks about not only I'm your God and I'm your boss, I took you out of Egypt to serve me, don't you dare serve any other God. What's so bad about these other gods? So the very concept of idol worship in Canaan, the Canaanite gods, was very simple. What happens? You have a, um, I'm sorry, 
let me get my picture back up. Okay. Um, what, what, we have as follows. Let me change my view real fast. Okay, really good. We have as follows. Most people need to survive. They need food. For food, you need rain in the land of Israel. You need fertility. And that's the Baal God. That's the rain God. That's Asherah God. How did the Canaanites get their rain? What do they believe in? If you do some ritual to a rain God, you'll get rain. Do some ritual for a fertility God, he'll help your crops grow. That's Baal and Asherah. There's a God, a grain God called Dagon. There's a sun God like in Egypt. His name was Ra. And the idea behind it is, if you need the powers of nature to help you, do some ritual to get those gods on your side. Along comes the Torah throughout. We say it in Shema, we say it in Parsha Mishpatim, everywhere. God says as follows, I have a set of laws for you to build a just and upright society. Of, of, of living a life of Mishpat and Staka. If you keep those laws and build a just society, God will reward you and take care of you. But if you don't, I'll have to punish you. So what God is saying, if you want rain, you don't need to pray for rain. God doesn't, it's not saying, don't pray to Baal, pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. No, when you pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you need to remember that God gives you rain based on your behavior. And that brings up a possibility, which will be, we'll see, all the Haftarot of Yom Kippur talk about it, uh, when we read in Shachrit and Yishayel, that don't think that prayer alone is going to give you rain. Or let's say you're in trouble. Let's say there's a war. Or let's say there's famine. Don't think that all you need to do is pray. You need to pray to remember there's a, probably a very good reason why God brought that calamity upon you. And therefore, you pray to remember you have to change your behavior. And should you change your behavior, then God will come and help you. And that's going to be the essence of Jewish prayer. And that's why there's such a danger in idol worship. Because in idol worship, if you need rain, the only thing you need to do is do a ritual, do some rain dance, or bring some sacrifice to some rain god, or to some fertility god. In Judaism, it's not enough to bring a sacrifice to God. You bring a sacrifice to God and pray to God to remember that he judges you based on your behavior. And that's going to be core in Judaism. Now, what will happen? You're going to come in the land. You're going to go astray. You won't build a just society. You won't follow the laws of Chumash. You won't build, keep all the laws of social justice and safety. Dvarim and Parshat Mishpatim and Kedoshim to you. You'll be like all the other nations. God don't have to punish you. When he punishes you, you're going to pray to him and save me. And God won't save you because you didn't fix your ways. And then you're going to turn to other gods to get your reign. And they're not going to help you either. And it get even worse. And it'll be a vicious cycle because until you fix your society, God's not going to help you. Or at least show sincerity that you want to fix your society. What am I going to change for one thing? Yeah. And, and therefore, what Chumash is going to say... Oh, no, he doesn't need to do it again. Okay. Um, he wear it again. But let me do one second. Let me mute everybody real fast. You know, okay. We can do that now. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. I just muted everybody. It's okay. Um... If someone wants to say something, just raise your hand and you can talk or put in the, in the. Um, yeah, and you the start. Start. Okay. Now, um, so what Shirat Azino is going to say, this is going to get into a vicious cycle. What I like to call in Yiddish called the Breges game, if you know Yiddish. Breges means you argue with each other and you never get out of the argument. You'll never, it's, we keep on blaming God, God keeps on blaming us. Shirat Azino, and now let's we go back to our screen share. And see what God has to say. Um, what's God say? I'm gonna, you're gonna come and say, Hello, Kena Lo Habikiri, because God's not helping me, He's not in my midst. All these bad things are happening. And God's saying, I'm gonna hide my face from you on that day because, because you turned to other gods instead of to me. And therefore, what's gonna be your eternal reminder of this thing? Therefore, teach this song to the Jewish people so they know it by heart. It'll be a warning, not a witness that I exist. It's a warning. Eight here means a warning to the Jewish people, a warning and a reminder of what's going to happen, uh, of, of why God chose you and what he expects from you. Now, look at the danger. Everything I just told you is in this knife. I'm going to bring them to the land that I promised their forefathers, a land flowing in milk and honey. That's antithetical to Sefer Dvarim, as opposed to Vachalta Vesabate Verachta from chapter 8 in Sefer Dvarim in, in Parsha Dekel. Instead of eating and being satisfied and thanking God, and not just saying thank you, but acting thank you, 
and using your prosperity to build a good society. Instead, you're going to become affluent, obnoxious, and haughty. We'll see this later in Yeshayahu as well. And then, you're going to turn to other gods and serve them. And you're going to make me annoyed at you. And you're going to break my covenant because you won't take your prosperity and use it properly. Then I have to punish you. When all the bad things happen to you and God has to send punishment upon you, this song will remind you who to blame. Because you don't by heart. Because I know the yetzer. I know the nature of man or man's tendency to sin, which he's, I know already today. Before I bring him land, I know it's bound to happen. Now, just skip real quickly to the shira. We'll see this thing. The first three lines are sort of introductory. Um, and, and the song begins with Pasuk Dalet. The first three lines is just a poetic introduction. Hatsur tamim po'olo. God, Hashem, he's always right. Let's get that straight. God's right, now let's talk. Why? Ki mishpat. His ways are always just. You might not understand them, but God is always right. Ele munav avel. He's a just God, a faithful God, no iniquity. Sadik via sharu. He's straight. Now comes the big question. Shichet lo, there's a question mark after that. Shichet lo, question mark. When, th- when there's corruption, when something goes wrong, like by chet ego or like the mabu, we have the word. Lechret ki shichet amcha. Or by before the flood. Ki shichet chobasar takol haaretz. If something is going wrong, and the God is going to mashchit, are you going to attribute it to him? The answer is lo, no. If you know the tamay mikra, you, you see how it's written. Shichet lo, question mark, lo. Banabumam, his children are to blame. Dori keshub tauto, a crooked generation. Haladon, I take milizot. Are you going to blame it on God? Am navav lo chacham, you foolish people. Halahu avicha kanecha, who is chavacham neneka? He bought you. He, he chose you. He took care of you. He wants you to be his nation. He wants to give blessing upon you. He wants you to do good. But if you're not doing your job properly, you have to punish you. Again, we're talking about on a national level. Not on an, we're talking about national behavior, not individual behavior. He chose you, he made you, get everything ready for you. And therefore, there's no reason for God to punish you just for the sake of punishing. If there's a punishment, there's a reason. Study history. Ask your go through a little bit of Jewish history, why God chose us among the nations and how he took us out of Egypt and took care of us in the desert. And then um, this is all about the desert time period. Hashem ben and then we get to what the land of Israel and Pasuk Yud Gimel, and um, we have lots of good food, etc. And then in Pasuk Tetvav is a sin. That's the and then the leave God who made them, and then everything goes bad, and then they're going to start following other gods. And then the rest is the shira in a, uh, in a poetic manner, how God's going to have to punish us. And the shira is saying at the end of the day, no matter how bad it gets, ultimately, God will, even though he'll judge his people, he'll have rachamim on us at the end because he'll feel sorry for us. And ultimately, he's going to come and help us. But when he does that, ruatah recognize it's me who's behind that. So let me just summarize why we did all this. What I'm trying to show you is that there's overall theme Chumash, that God is going to use punishment, be it nature or be it war or be it um, you know sickness, whatever it might be. That's going to be a wake up call to us. And again, if we're not doing a good job as a nation, he'll have to punish us in some form or other. When that punishment comes, he'll want us to wake up and fix our ways. Um, let me just give a quick example from um, from sh- when uh, on Yom Kippur again, the big avodas in the Beit Hamikdash. I want to give an example from Shlomo Melech. What happens? What's supposed to happen in the Beit Hamikdash? Because people think the Beit Hamikdash, you bring carbonot and you pray to God and it'll come and save you. I want to take a look at Shlomo Melech's prayer when he dedicates the Beit Hamikdash uh, the first time. There's a famous. Um, like this one here. If you remember the first letter of Slichot, like about a week ago, we said, 
and we had a beautiful pew, the Shema Lerina Belat Fila. So that's the quote from Shlomo Amela's prayer, because in chapter 8, after he dedicates the Beit HaMikdash, he turns to God and says, now that we built this temple, we have a place to pray. He's saying this place is not simply a place to bring Korbanot, it's a place also for, for prayer. So it says, Again, we're in chapter 8, uh, verse 28, starting from there. Perik, again, Perichet, Pasak, Chavchet, and Sefer Melachim. To listen to, to, um, to prayer. Right? And he asked that God's eyes should be open to this house day and night to hear the tefillah that Am Yisrael prayed to you. Now, um, let's take a look now at the different, where's my marker? One second. Oh, here we are. How do we annotate? One second. There used to be an annotate button. I guess we don't have one on this one. Not that one. Already. Um, I'll use this marker then. Here, here we go. Um, okay. You you hear the prayer of your servant who prayed to you. Listen carefully. You'll hear and you'll forgive. Not just hear and answer prayer, but you'll forgive. And he gives an example. Should there be war? Why is there trouble? Because we've sinned. Now, let's move down a little bit. It says, What are we praying for? We're praying to recognize that the reason why we're losing battle is because we've sinned. And therefore, we pray to God to forgive us for what we've done wrong. And then bring it back to you. The same thing when there's no rain. Like we say in Shema. I'm just trying to prove to you from Shlomo Melech everything I just, I just told you. That if there's a famine or a drought or trouble, it's because we've sinned. And that's clear. Why do we daven? We daven to show God we understand we've done something wrong. We gather together and hear a rabbi's speech. We hear Musar. We try to find out what we're doing wrong. Right? And then, This is very different than classic prayer. We don't, we don't pray to God for rain. We don't pray for God for health. We pray to God to remember that our well-being is a function of our deeds. And we pray to remember in a transformative manner that we better fix our ways to be worthy of God's help. And if something's bad's happening, not to blame God, but to see that as a wake-up call from God to fix our ways. And listen carefully to Lamed Vav. And we come to the Mikdash to find guidance of how to behave, to show us the proper way to act. And then, And that idea goes on and on in... Um, and that nevoa. I'm explaining that, that same idea. And it's so central to the theme of Chumash, and that's the danger of idol worship. Because in idol worship, if you want rain, you simply do a ritual for a rain god. Chumash is saying, that's not enough. It's not that I have to pray to the correct god. I have to get the right address and know which god to pray to. No, there's one god who's in, tra- who's in charge of all those powers of nature, but he judges you based on your behavior, not only based on your prayers. Of course, you need to pray, but you need to pray has to be transformative. Now, Chazal beautifully picked this theme for the Aftara for Yom Kippur morning. And let me show you that. Um, do, let me open up a Tanakh now. We read in on Yom Kippur morning, we read from Yeshayel. Let me open up a, I'll open the Tanakh. It's easy to, yeah, this is a good one. Nice big English. And we'll go to Yishayel. What's interesting is everyone knows the Aftar from Mincha for Yom Kippur because it's Maftar Yonah, but we rarely pay attention to Yishayel. By the way, as long as I have Yishayel open, in Perak Aleph, it was everything I just said. Uh, your country is in destruction you know, because you've sinned, because you're acting like Stomina Mora. Um, what's God say? Uh, they'll listen up, all you, you know, all you people, you're acting like Stomina Mora. You could be officers in Stomina Mora. Who needs your sacrifices? 
I'm sick of all your animals. When you come to my temple to come and see me, you're trespassing, Pasuk Yedvet. Quit bringing me these meaningless korbanot. And then Pasuk Yedalev. I hate your holidays, your Rosh Chodesh parties, your, 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 your Yom Tovim, Shalosh Regalim. When you come to visit me, the, he's saying they're annoying. If, I don't know if you ever had guests at your house who you can't wait to leave. Uh, when you come to visit me, I'm annoyed by you. I can't take it anymore. And here's the key one. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I'm not going to answer your prayers. That's Esther Panim. Your behavior, you, you're causing innocent people to die. Your behavior is causing death. Instead, rachatzu, clean up your ways. Get rid of evil from among you. Stop doing chidum hareya. Look for doing good. Teach how to do good. Do justice. Get rid of things that are wrong. Uh, take care of the orphan and the widow. And then God says, I'm willing to forgive you if you fix your ways. If you come and listen, then to Barstachelu. If you don't listen, there'll be death and there'll be war and there'll be punishment. And what happened to the city? Remember, Meleti Mishpat Sari Kelimbiba, and now they're full of murders. Okay. All your money is counterfeit, means you're cheating in business. All your Sarim, all your officers, or all your ministers are gone astray. They're rebellious. Everyone's a bunch of criminals. They're all stealing. Everyone's taking bribes looking for wealth, and instead of taking care of the orphan and the widow and the uh, downtrodden, they're just worrying about themselves and not about the people. And therefore, God has to punish you, and I'm going to give you new leadership. And then the famous line, which we quote in Shemon Esrei, Bashiva Shavtaik Rishona, that's the Pasuk of Bashiva Shavtaik Rishona, V'yotzaik Batchila. Then, when that's done, then you can call, then Jerusalem be called the city of justice, and then what will redeem Zion, it's like it's a massive theme all through Isaiah. Now, just a quick um, jump ahead. Yeshayahu to Perak to our Haftarah. Actually, I want to do show with you something really interesting beforehand. Um, at the end of chapter 59, there's a Pasik we say every day. Remember Uvalitsim Goel? We say this after Davening every day. We say it all the time. It's like the end of the day. We're hoping for a redeemer to come to Zion. And get God remember his brief, which we'll talk about soon. And um, they'll, they'll be there forever. But that's the end of a parak that begins as follows. Chapter 59, Yeshayah begins as follows. And this is the whole thing I told you. God's hand is not too short to help out. No, if God's not helping, it's not because he's not able. It's not because his hand is too short to reach out and help us. And if he doesn't hear your prayer or your cry, it's not because his ears are heavy and he can't hear you. If God's not helping, it's not because he can't help you or because he doesn't hear you. What's causing prayer not to be heard? Your sins are causing this divide between you and your God. Listen carefully. Your sins are causing God to master panim from hearing. Remember I told you aster panim is when God doesn't hear prayer. He hears prayer, but he doesn't answer prayer. That's aster panim. Aster panim is when we turn to God and we're not worthy because of our actions that he's not helping us. But that, that's the beginning of chapter 59. Now the Haftarah for, for Yom Kippur is in chapter 58. Um, actually, it starts in chapter, it starts at the end of chapter 57, but it's just a beautiful psukim of Amar um, Solu Solu Pana Derech. Um, it's a beautiful poetic introduction, but we're just going to start right to, um, we're going to go right to, right to chapter 58. And again, it's Haftar we read, and Chazal picked this not by chance. This is right the theme of Yom Kippur Davening. Listen how it goes. Krab the garon al tachsoch means call out. The navi is telling. I mean, God's telling the navi, call out with your voice. And look at the beautiful analogy we use here. You know, it's cry aloud. Don't hold back. Kish shofar harim kalecha. Right? Raise up your voice like a shofar. Now that has a double meaning, because it means shofar is loud and everyone hears it. But the purpose of blowing the shofar is exactly the same idea of 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 hitorurut of zichronot to remember 
Not that God exists, but he judges you based on your deeds. And therefore, when you hear the shofar, that should cause proper tshuva. It's when you understand not only that God exists, but he judges you based on your deeds, that understanding should be transformative and lead to better behavior. That was the theme of Zichronot um, on Rosh Hashanah. Tell my people how bad their sins are. Now, Yeshayahu is going to go on a rant here and super sarcastic. And the way, the fact that Chazal chose this sarcastic haftarah for Yom Kippur is, is so beautiful. And it's all going to relate back to what I gave in my introduction about um, what the underlying theme of Brit Sinai is about what it means to be God's people and how Judaism is different than idol worship. He's going to now attack people who are into what I guess, I guess we call nowadays maybe from kite or, or spirituality. He says like this, My people, every day, they're coming to Doresh Hashem. They're coming to look for God. But not they want to know the ways of God. They want to be close to God. They want to understand God. They're acting like a nation who's just. They're acting as though they're keeping God's laws properly. Because all they're doing all day long is looking for spirituality and closeness to God. They're asking me questions. What's this law? What's that law? They want to be close to God. But the same people who's turning to God all the time, they don't understand why God is not answering their prayers. And now we quote the people. The people are saying, How come we're fasting and you don't see our fast? That's right from Yom Kippur. Remember, Benita Menaf Shotechem? He's saying, we've afflicted our souls, and it looks like you don't know. You don't know what's going on. The people are complaining here. This is the people talking. And now God's going to answer back sarcastically. Right? Do you think um, your day of fast, you can go on with your regular businesses and keep acting and continuing to, um, <coughs> to take advantage of other people. Are you fasting? Continue fighting and arguing with one another? Okay. You're not fasting for the right reason. And now he's going to yell at them. This is a sarcastic statement. Do you call this a fast day? He says, it's a question mark. Do you think this is the fast day that I'm cho- that I've chosen? Yom Adam Nafsho, is this Is this the affliction of the soul that God wants? Halachov Kagmon Rosho, does God want you to bow your head down, like a like a what's called a in, like bow down in a, like a like a uh, like we do on Tisha B'av? V'sak ve'efer yatzia, halaseti kratzom v'yom ratzon Hashem. Do you think that's a fast day? Walking down with your head in a, in a, in a bag and, and wearing sackcloth and fetching all day long? That's a fast day? Then he answers, that's not a fast day. This is the fast day that God wants. Okay? Get rid of the fetters of wickedness. Undo the bonds of people who are oppressed. Let the oppressed people, let them go. Take people off from their loans. Anyone who's under distress, break off those yokes of, bank, of, of, of trouble. Feed those who, who are hungry. Not just feed poor people, bring them into your home. Because people are not only poor uh, physically, they're, they're poor also socially. Take the, uh, the depressed people, the uh, people are unhappy, bring them into your home, make them happy. Not just feed them um, with nutrition, feed them also spiritually, feel them socially. People need clothing, help them out. And make and then if that's how you act, and that's a fast day, then your light will shine through and things will grow. Then and now here's the big line, Pasik Ted, and this was Shlomo's prayer. After fixing your ways and building that society that's just and upright and using your prosperity properly, instead of leading to haughtiness and affluence, take your prosperity and build a just society. Then when you call out to me, God will answer. If you just call out to me, I need food, I need rain, I, I need money, and you pray to God directly just for that, 
but don't know what to do with it. If he blesses you with that, God won't answer your prayer. But when you pray to him after acting properly, if you get rid of in your midst people who like pointing fingers at other people, speaking wickedly about other people, blaming this on that, and I don't have to bring examples from modern day times. And then again, take out, take care of the hungry, and then, um, then your light will shine through from the darkness. And instead of being in the dark, you'll be like shining through in the night. And then God will rest upon you. And you have what's chilutz samot, And then things will be good again. And your destructed areas will come back to life again. Um, and then you'll, anyway, he goes on and on about how then Shabbat will be a true Shabbat. Then, then all the laws of Shabbat are in the last line. Tashir Shabbat Raglecha. Remember that Shabbat of Sefer Devarim, but that's just Shabbat of remembering God created, but Shabbat of, of uh, giving your workers a day of rest. Remember the idea of social justice on Shabbat. As, as Hashem, all these miracles of Shabbat are all based on all these psukim in the end of the parak. So in a nutshell, the third that Chazal picked for, for Yom Kippur Day is exactly that theme of tshuva. Now, I want to use that as a background now to try to understand um, how does this explain the Avodah of Yom Kippur? Because when we study Yom Kippur the regular way, it seems like Yom Kippur is the exact opposite. It seems like, what do we do on Yom Kippur? If the Kohen Gadol goes in and shakes the right animal and sprinkles the right blood and does all the ritual in the temple, we'll be absolved from all of our sins. That's the, when you read the, the laws of Yom Kippur, and the Seder Avodah, and you read it, it sounds like the exact opposite of everything I just explained. It sounds like all we need to do is send our coin Gadol, make sure he's wearing the right clothing, and he you know, goes to the mikvah the proper way, and he shakes the right animal and sprinkles the blood at the right places and does the smoke and everything, and everything could be fine. What I want to show you, quite the opposite. I want to show you that when you understand the, the technical details of the ritual, and, with, and the whole concept of kapara and chumash, it's the exact same thing I'm talking about. So let me, um, let me give an introduction and then I'll share with you some sources. I want to begin with what's the goal of the, um, of the Yom Kippur service? What's, what are we doing and why the date? So the date of Yom Kippur, according to Chazal, and you can almost, it's almost, it's almost logical, that conclusion, that Yom Kippurim is the day that Moshe came down with the second Luchot. So first you can do a quick um, calculation. We know that Amisa arrived in Harsinai in the third month, and then Moshe went up, down, came down, but give or take a couple of days. But within the first week of the month of Sivan, of the third month, Moshe goes up to Harsinai and we get the Ten Commandments. So we enter, we say Nasa Venishma and we enter a brit with God. Then he goes up for another 40 days to receive the laws. The first 40 days it goes up in the end of Parsha Mishpatim. And he comes down 40 days later, according to our tradition, now on the 17th of Tammuz and breaks the Luchot. And those 40 days are described not only in Shemot, also in Parsha Ekev. Then in Parsha Ekev, he says he daven for 40 days. And then God forgave them. And therefore he finishes at the end of Elul. At the end of, I'm sorry, at the end of Av. And on Rosh Chodesh Elul, he goes up for another 40 days. And if he goes up on Rosh Chodesh Elul, he comes down 40 days later on Yom Kippurim. But there's another reason. Why is a holiday called Yom Kippurim? We have to see the concept of kapara in Chumash. Now, what does kapara mean? And, and what's the meaning of kapara? And, what, and why is it that um, we have the first luchot and then the broken and we have a second luchot? What's going on? What's behind the story? Behind the story is a theme, which I like to call sort of the, um, I guess, the essence of life or, or the nature of relationship. And follow the pattern what happens over and over again. God makes man, puts him in Gan Eden. What happens? He sins. Now, it sounds like, oh, had man not sinned in Gan Eden, everything would be great today. But there's another way of looking at it. It could be that Chumash is using the Gan Eden story later and the Mabel story and kind of have all the stories in Breshit before Avram is chosen. He's using them to set a pattern so we understand what happens at Har Sinai. What I want to claim is, is that according to Chazal, we receive Sefer Breshit at Harsinai. If you remember Rashi, and when we say Nasa Benishma and Shmo 
Moshe takes Sefer Abrit and reads it out loud during the three days of preparation. He says, that's Sefer Breshit. What's Moshe doing? For the three days of preparation before we enter a covenant, we need to study a book that explains to us why we're chosen, which is the book of Sefer Breshit. It's not just a covenant between God and his people. In Avram, it's also a covenant between God and all creation. That's the story after the flood. But all the stories that precede Avram being chosen talk about God having high expectations for man. Remember man in Gan Eden? Man sinning. God is upset. And then God does something about it, but a whole new relationship begins. So man is thrown out of Gan Eden, but, but, the, um, but now has a new relationship with God uh, to work the lamb. Not, we won't go into the kind of the Hevel story, but in a nutshell, the sin in Gan Eden is disobeying God, Ben Adam Lamakom. The sin in Kain Vehevel is Ben Adam Lachavero, the first case of murder, but one man hurting his fellow man. But the, the most important story is going to be the flood story. Because what do we learn from the flood story? In the story of the flood, we know that God has high expectations for man. We realize in the flood story that God wants civilization to be good. Otherwise, he wouldn't punish them. There aren't commandments before the flood. But the fact that God made man with the knowledge of good and bad, he's expecting good behavior. Now, how to define good, you can argue. You, know, you can argue what defines good, but try your best to do good. And you argue about what's good. Man went corrupt. And then what does God do? He decides to bring destruction. He brings the flood. When the flood's over, God decides what? I'm not going to do that again. Now, we call this anthropo anthropomorphism which I think is the, uh, we describe God in human terms, not because God acts like a human, but so that we can relate to God, we describe in human terms. But listen to that pattern and tell me if you've ever acted that way. You, you do something, you come up with an idea, you do something, you're upset with what you did and you sort of undo it. And then you, you regret what you've done. And then you regret that you regretted and promise not to do that again. It's such a classic human pattern of behavior. Again, I'm trying to describe, Chumash is describing God in that manner because that describes human behavior as well. Let me explain what I'm getting at. I want to read two sections, one before the flood and one after the flood that are going to be, I think, key in understanding Yom Kippur. And we'll soon we'll see why. If we look in, um, let me share my screen here real fast. If I look in the story of the flood, let me go back to my Chumash. We want to go back to Sefer Breshit. If you open up Sefer Breshit, chapter six, it's the last Aliyah in Parshat Breshit. The beginning of Eric Vav in chapter six. But we're still in Parshat Breshit, but the last Aliyah. Pasake says as follows. Hashem ki ra'at adam ba'aretz. What did God see? Man is just bad. V'cho yetzer machshavot libo rak rak kol hayom. Is only bad. Remember that phrase? What does God see? Man is just bad all the time. Lost cause. God upset he made man. And then but God says, God says, I've had it. I'm starting over again. And, and Noah found favor in God's eyes. And then we have the story of the flood. When the flood is over, if you go to the end of chapter 8, you'll see something very interesting. The flood is over. Noach brings his korbanot. In verse 18, Noach leaves the teva together with his family. He builds a mizbech in Pasachaf, even mizbech, and he brings the kosher animals and brings korbanot. Pasachaf Aleph, listen carefully, and tell me if this rings a bell. Look at the parallel between before the flood and after the flood. God smells the korban. This is the first time we have reach nichoach in Chumash. And this is key to understanding korbanot. Rech nichoach, every rech nichoach, in my opinion, is based on this. All, all the all the korbanot, the korbanot tamid, musafim, they're all rech nichoach ishal Hashem. What's rech nichoach mean to us when we bring a korban? God smells the rech nichoach. Vayomer Hashem el libo, lo osif lekala odet adama b'vor adam. I'm not going to go and bring another flood or destroy mankind again. I'm not going to hit the reset button. Why? Ki yetsem achlev adam raminu urav. Because the nature of man is to be evil from his youth. And therefore, I'm not going to destroy mankind again. Now, 
What's God saying? The man is a lost cause? If I only had this Pusik by itself, it'd be difficult to understand. But when I parallel it to the earlier Pusik before the flood, you can't miss the connection. Before the flood, when God says, I've had it with man, they're only bad. Now they're bad in his youth or in his early stages, which means we're living in a world of tikkun. You begin with the nature to do things, to do evil, to do bad, but you can learn from your mistakes. And what I want to suggest here is the idea of a korban, you know, when you bring an animal to God and you bring a korban and you smell the rech nichoach, together with the story of the flood, you need to remember that even though God has high expectations for man, he's willing to accept man's um, frailty or man's nature of sinning if man can learn from his mistakes. And this opens a whole new relationship with God, and we're going to see the parallel in the history of Am Yisrael. This between God and mankind. But what makes civilization tick? In what way does civilization continue to grow? What happens is man does something wrong. Okay? Something bad happens. He'll recognize his mistake. He has the ability to learn from his mistake and grow from his mistake. If you know like Ego, it's like it's called uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, where you start one direction, then you break it, you know, undo it, and then you synthesize what you thought was right, what you did wrong, and then put them all together again. But the idea that God is willing to accept man the way he is, with the hope that man can learn from his mistakes, that's how we grow. That's how you learn to ride a bike. You know, you do something, you fall, but you learn from your mistakes, you pick it up. You want to build a plane? The Wright brothers didn't fly their first plane. They crashed 16 before they built the Kitty Hawk. The, the way you grow is by learning from mistakes. Now, the nature of man is he makes mistakes. A friend of mine told me, he was a CEO somewhere, he says the main thing he learned in business is that no good deed goes unpunished. You try to do something good and you always gonna hurt someone's feelings, something will go wrong. You wanna do well and everyone is angry with you, even though you wanted to do good. But you can learn from your mistakes. And when I understand life that way, they don't expect to be perfect, but live a life of trying to perfect. That's a whole new relationship with God, but not just as an individual, as society, as people, almost a civilization, civilization can grow if people recognize that people make mistakes, but you can learn from your mistakes. And that's how you grow. And if it wasn't for making mistakes, we'd never be able to grow. If people were perfect, civilization would never advance. So there's something good about bad, which might go back to the theme of Gan Eden with the Eitzadat the Tov Ra, where Tov and Ra, sort of one, you can't have one without the other. You can't appreciate Tov without without the ability also to do evil and do bad. Now, why am I saying this is the setup for Har Sinai? So we have the story of the flood here. But remember, Noah was Matzachem Bene Hashem. Who else was Matzachem Bene Hashem? That was Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, the flood is 40 days and 40 nights. Here, I'll give you a, a set of, uh, let me show you all the parallels. Let me share my screen real fast. Uh, new share, oh, wait, not new share. Just get rid of that share. Sorry about that. I want to show you a set of parallels between the flood story and not just Moshe Rabbeinu, but Moshe Rabbeinu and Har Sinai. If I take a look, and um, you can think of them in the meantime on your own, but um, let's go back to, that's the wrong file. We want this file. So there we go. Um, no, not that file, nice mistake. There we go. There. Um, first of all, the word Teva. I hope you see my screen now. The word Teva, uh, the word Teva is classic, isn't it? Because it's only twice in Chumash. It saves Noah and also saves Moshe Rabbeinu. Only two people in Chumash are Matzachem B'nei Hashem. God, I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu and Noah. They're the sources. Two stories with 40 days and 40 nights, the flood and our Sinai. And there's seven days that, pre that precede the 40 days and 40 nights. The theme of 120 years is unique to Moshe Rabbeinu. And the story also before the flood of, um, but, but that's again beyond the scope of the share. But the main thing is, God tells Noah, let me destroy everyone and make you the only one. And Noah accepts that. God tells Moshe Rabbeinu the same thing. Let me destroy everyone and make you the only one. But Moshe davens. And that would be the contrasting parallel, which is the key difference. God, Moshe argues with God, but they both get the same, uh, the same offer. We have Ashkatava both, but our topic will be 
this covenant between God and a people will be very similar to the covenant that followed the flood. And the covenant that's going to follow the sin of the golden calf, what we call the Brit of the 13, or the second Luchot, that covenant is going to be parallel um, to the covenants that preceded in Chumash, especially the, what's called the Rainbow Covenant, where God makes it official that he's not going to bring another flood. So I'll just review that covenant real quickly, just to just see the, how parallels are so obvious. Okay, Remember, God blesses Noah and tells him, Pruer Vul, right there? And God says, I'm going to make a Brit with you. And look at the wording, there won't be another flood. And then God says, to be an Otbrit, um, and the Keshet, the rainbow will be, a Otbrit, Benu Ben Aretz. I want to point out the key phrases, establishing a covenant. If you remember Zichronot, we quoted this. Um, there's an Otbrit, as a reminder of the covenant. It's a Brit Olam. It's a Brit forever. The word olam should be here, but I guess I left it out. But it says here, Brit Olam. And it's a Brit Beni Ubein. And the Brit is B'Shem Elohim, the God of creation. Skip 10 chapters later, God picks Avram Avinu. And the next time Elohim speaks to anyone after this um, rainbow covenant is when he makes Brit Milah with Avram Avinu. And again, like Noah, Noah was a tzaddik and was Tamim and walked with God. That's what Noach was. That's what Avram needs to be. God says, I'll make a breed between me and you, and you, and I'll multiply you. Uh, and then here's the big phrase, the same phrase. It'll be a breed to Olam, an eternal covenant. And here the covenant is, I'm your God, you're my people. And to, to facilitate the covenant, I'm giving you the land of Israel where it can be your God. And um, circumcision will be the old breed. So you have a breed, you have a, you have a covenant, you have a symbol of the covenant. It's a Brit Olam. It's an eternal covenant. It's between Elohim and either civilization, or now it's between Elohim and Abraham. It means there's a connection between, between God's Brit with all civilization after the flood, his Brit with Avram Avinu, and later his Brit at Har Sinai. We have the same phrases, like um, the same thing, and then Beiti Lechem Leim Batem Tulilam. That's the, that's the exact same phrase we had in, in Brit Mila. Let, let me give you an example of Yom Kippur Daphne. One of the songs we sing is Anu Amecha Telohinu, Anu Banecha Tavinu, Anu Tsonecha Tarainu, Anu Kolecha, all that stuff, like 12 different ways, saying the same idea that we're working for you. You're a boss, we're your people, we're your servants. You're like a father, we're like your children. You're our God, we're your servants. You know, you're, you're our shepherd, we're your flock. But that idea that God chose us to be his Babu nation has meaning in light of the flood. Because once you understand this concept of tshuva, that God no longer expects man to be perfect. God wants man to try to be perfect, but he tends to make mistakes. The idea that you can learn from your mistakes and grow from them and become better people through that process of recognizing mistake learning from them and growing from them, that God expects that from all people. And therefore, if there's a society that's corrupt, he's hoping that leadership will stem, will sort of sprout up in that society because just like every living thing can fix itself, right? a human body has disease, um, it can create antibodies. It has the ability to predict itself. Sometimes, you, sometimes it can't, sometimes it can't. Just like every living thing, every living organism has the ability to identify trouble disease, attack it, um, and, and build from it. And then, then they have what's called a, um, they become, um, what's called a, uh, like a vaccine. When you become immune to it, once you build up those antibodies, in a similar manner, if society does something wrong, they can learn from their mistakes and build something so it won't happen again. That's the history of government, of society, of laws, and things like that, in an attempt to do good. Now, Will it happen? That's up to mankind, but it can happen. But that's how people grow. Now, because things went wrong, you know, God was hoping society would work that way. It didn't work. The Tower of Babel was like a disaster. And then God has to scatter people among different nations. God's going to choose one nation, not just to be his model nation for good behavior. What I want to claim is we're God's model nation because not only do we have to behave properly, we have to be the model of learning from our mistakes. We're going to do things. We're, 
We're bound to do things wrong. That's what God tells Moshe in Shirat Azino. You're bound to sin. You're bound to go astray. It's bound to happen. The main thing I want you to do is learn from your mistakes and grow from them. That's the whole process of tshuva. It's very different where God expecting you to be perfect. That's the first luchot. Of midat adin. In the second luchot, God no longer expects Am Yisrael to be perfect. We're not Am But we have the ability to learn from our mistakes and grow from them. And now we're being a model nation, not only being perfect all the time, we can be a model nation by being a nation that learns from its mistakes. I think that's going to be the essence of Yom Kippur. And we'll see how the Avoda might um, represent that idea. But what I want to claim is, is all these parallels to the flood and the flood story, and we'll see now them in Yom Kippur, and this whole idea of Brit, is that if, if behavior is contagious, and indeed it is contagious, we see that um, in our day-to-day lives all the time, especially nowadays. You know, if, if these people break the law, we're going to break the law. If these people, the behavior is contagious. We know that. And therefore, you need people who are going to be the models of good behavior, because if they act properly, we'll be the model for the other people to learn from. Like example nowadays, let's say it's important to, you know, keep social distancing and things. So are the religious people, the people claiming to be God's servants, are they going to be the model of following those rules, protecting life and, and being the shining example of how a society should act? Or are they going to be an example of people only care about themselves and don't care about the, the cloud? That's a challenge you have and what it means to be religious or what it means to be a, an Ever Hashem. But this concept of you can learn the behavior is contagious and you can learn from your mistakes and grow from them. It's not just something we do as people, as, as individuals, it's something we can do as a nation, but also as a model nation, because that's the nature of God and mankind. That's the nature of God and civilization. And that's, that's how you build a relationship with God, not just with God, but with, with your fellow man as well. You grow not only by being perfect, you grow from learning from your mistakes. And therefore, we're going to dedicate a holiday to that whole concept of kapar, of, of tshuva. Now, in um, the, what do you call it? The idea of, the idea of Brit Sinai that all began beforehand, where God says, you know, look what I did for you. I took you out of Egypt. Are you willing to keep my Brit? This is before the Ten Commandments in Sefer Shemot. You may, you're my chosen nation. You'll be a, um, a nation representing me. A goy kadosh, a nation separated to serve me. That'll be the Brit of Brit Sinai. And then the idea that Shabbat is an old, Shabbat will be the old Brit of Brit Sinai. It'll be a Brit Olam, Benu Ben. But you see, all the themes of Har Sinai all going to echo the themes of, of um, are going to echo all those themes of, um, they go back to the flood. What I'm trying to claim is that the story of the flood is a setup. The way Chomish tells the story of the flood is written in a manner to help us appreciate what happens at Har Sinai. No, um, I know I gave you this share earlier, probably a couple of years, a year or two ago, about um, in the story of Chet Ego, it's another type of sin that was bound to happen. But first we get the, the Ten Commandments and we break them. God gets angry, wants to wipe us out. Instead, Moshe is going to daven and he's going to make a new treaty. But in a nutshell, what I want to claim is the first contract, the first luchot, God is very demanding, expects us to be perfect. In the second one, he's willing to be forgiving. Now, without going into all the details of it, all we need to do is show you, where's the, um, here. I'll just, I think we did the share, the long version. I'll just give the quick summary. If you look on the left side, here. Um, when the Luchot, when we get the first Luchot, we have as follows. Um, in, the first, in, the, in the first Luchot, God is an El Kana. Remember? He's Poked Avon the Stonai. He's Ose Chesed Lohavai. He's Lo Yinake, and Lo Yisalat Beishechem, and he's, he has Charonaf. Basically, before Chet Egel, in every key section, God's attributes are only din. He's demanding. He's a zealous God, quick to punish. He punishes people who hate him to the tenth nth degree, meaning I'll punish you and your children and grandchildren up to four generations. I'll punish you if you hate me. It means if you don't. If you love me and keep my laws, or vice from me for that, then I'll do chesed for you. But who gets chesed? Only people who deserve it. Who gets punishment? People who don't follow God. If you do something wrong, carry God's name in vain. Make a chilo Hashem. God can't clean away that sin. And if you sin, he said for kilo God can't take away your sin. And when we do sin, he kindles the anger immediately and wants to destroy them. So my claim is, is that in the first contract, which is sort of a setup for the second contract, 
God expects us to be perfect. We can't live up to it. And therefore, God threatens to punish us. Moshe Davins, and in Moshe's prayer, he basically says as follows. On the one hand, there's no way that your people can be so perfect. There's no way we could survive based on the principles of the first luchot. It's too strict. There's no way man can be so perfect because we, you'd have to punish us immediately, every time. And that's what God says, if you remember that line, um, um, God said beforehand, God told Moshe here beforehand, God said, after the sin of the ego, God said, I'm not coming with you. Go to Israel without me because you're an Oref. And afterwards, Moshe asked, come with us, even though we're an Oref. We'll see that soon. Um, now, after all of Moshe Rabbeinu is arguing, but Moshe argues as follows. Moshe says, basically, um, what did Moshe say beforehand? Um, Moshe prayed to God and said, he tells Moshe in, in Sefer Shah, just one, one quick section in Periklam and Gimel. Moshe tells God after Chet Egel, he says, look, you're telling me to go to Israel without you. Okay, But listen, they're your people. They're not my people. And God says, I'll go with you, but not with them. And Moshe says, if you don't come with all of us, we're not going nowhere. And Moshe is demanding that God be with everybody. We're your people. Come with us. God says, I'll come with you. I'll have to kill you. Moshe says, you got to come with us and don't kill us. So therefore, we need a new deal, which have the attributes of mercy. And this is what we read in Slichot all the time. What's God tell Moshe? Rabin? Okay, because you were Motzachem Be'enai, goes back to the flood story. Um, I'm willing to agree to this new deal. Moshe wants how it's going to work. And God says as follows. God says now in the new covenant, not that I will forgive, I can forgive. Pay attention. Oh, oh, that point's clear. Meaning, who gets chanina, who gets forgiveness and mercy? Only people who God decides. Now, that's not saying, oh, it's like rolling dice. If you pray to me at midnight, I want to pray at 10 at night, I won't answer the prayer. If you pray, you know, at I will. Or if you pray, you know, standing this way, I will. The other way, not. Or maybe, you know, 50-50 chance kind of thing. It means I can forgive, but you have to prove to me you're worthy of forgiveness. Let's go to Chubal, Tfilah, Tztakam, Avrin, And then understanding that God can forgive, but you have to be worthy of his forgiveness. That will be the key understanding of the second Luchot, which will be the new Brit that he's going to make. And therefore, God tells Moshe to come on up to the mountain. And now, right on the Luchot, the same thing that the first Luchot, the, the written contract will be what's expected. Midat Adin. And then, as God gives Moshe Rabbeinu, the second Luchot, God passes in front of Moshe as he gives him the Luchot and declares his new Midot, which is a famous Hashem Kel Rachum V'chanun Erchapayim Rav Chesed B'emet. Now, if you follow what I'm telling you, the second Luchot is the exact opposite of the first Luchot. Now Hashem is El Rachum V'chanun as opposed to El Kana. Before he was a zealous God, immediate punishment. Now he's a forgiving God. He can forgive. Before God would get angry immediately, Haron Av, now he's Erech Apayim, he's slow to anger. Before who got Chesed? Only Oavai V'shomrei Mitzvotai. Now who gets Chesed? Only what he called. Anyone can get Chesed. Rav Chesed. An abundance of Chesed. Even those who don't deserve it. Chazal Sinir Tzadik Varala Rosh And note that he, he might hold back Chesed for later. He might give an abundance beforehand. It has to be balanced with truth. But it's not only people who love him. Everyone gets Chesed from God. God before said, I won't carry away sin. Now he is no Nosev on Vefesha. God said, for lo yinakeh. Now God says, v'nakeh. I will clean away sin. So Rashi is nakeh l'shavim. V'lo menakeh l'enam shavim. You do tshuva, yes. But now I can forgive. And now instead of punishing four generations, God puts up punishment for up to four generations. And therefore, God says, now that's the new, that's the new relationship. And that goes back to what I said before. What's this new relationship God tells us, which is the second luchot, which Moshe receives on Yom Kippur? Not that I will forgive, but I can forgive. Beforehand, yes or no, you're in or out. You're perfect, fine, not perfect, you're out. Here, I can get my job back. God's willing to be forgiving, on the condition, recognize what we did wrong. 
Now, in light of this, you can really understand what we say every day in Shabbat so beautifully. Before we ask for rain, and before we ask for prosperity, before Rafa'inu and before Birchat Hashanim, before Gula and everything, the first three brachot of Shmonesrei is first I ask for wisdom. Chonein dat, it goes back to Gan Eden. I don't ask God, I want to be a smart aleck. I want to be smart so I can show off. I want wisdom to be able to differentiate between good and bad. Because if I don't know what's good and what's, if I don't have a desire and understanding of what's right and what's wrong, I can't begin the process of tshuva. If I don't know what I did wrong, if I can't, don't have the understanding to learn from my mistakes, I can't fix anything. And therefore, the first thing we ask God for, give us the ability to understand, to use our brain and understanding wisely and help us understand what's tov and what's raw. That's atachonim ladamda. Now, once I know and understand what's right and what's wrong and have the ability to discern that, then I want to have the desire to repent and learn from my mistakes. That's birchat tshuva. And if I do repent, I want God to accept that repentance. That's lachlanu. That's, um, that's, so the first three brachot is exactly the idea I talked about. Before we ask for rain and for refuah and for parnasah and shmanas, right? before we ask for our needs, the first thing we ask for is for the ability to do tshuva, the desire to do tshuva, and for God to accept our tshuva. We do that every day. On Yom Kippur, we make a holiday about it. Because what are we celebrating? The fact that on this day, God gave us the ability to you know, to enter this new type of relationship. He no longer expects us to be perfect, but he wants us to perfect and learn from our mistakes. And we're going to dedicate this whole day to that concept of tshuva. Now, after God declares this, remember God said, I'm not coming with you, and now Moshe wants him to come. So Moshe quickly goes down. Let me do this on a, uh, this is a better one. Um, remember, by Moshe goes quickly and says, Imna Hashem, now that I found favor and you have these numidot, now will you travel with us? Even though we're in Amkshe'orath and forgive us when we do something wrong, we have this in davening all the time, which is in contrast before he says, I'm not coming with you because we're in Amkshe'orath. And now he's saying, come with us even though we're in Amkshe'orath. So according to Chazal, God's answer is not so fast. God says, I'm not dwelling with you right away. If you know your Chumash, this is happening. Moses is coming down on Yom Kippur, on the 10th of Tishrei. What's God's answer? I can forgive you. You have to prove to me you're worthy of my forgiveness. And therefore, what commandment does Am Yisrael receive now? This is chapter 34, the Mishkan. You want my Shekhinah to return? Prove to me you really want me to dwell among you. Prove to me you can follow orders. Prove to me you can work together as a nation. Prove to me you can use your creativity in a positive way. Build me a Mishkan. And the act, the ritual of building the Mishkan, and that joint effort, the working together, the nedava of everyone, the joint effort, working together, sharing your abilities, sharing, using your creativity in the service of God, that'll be a model of building the proper society. And the Shekhinah only returns six months later on Rosh Chodesh Nistam, when they, on Yom HaShmini, when they dedicate the Mishkan. That's the end of Sefer Shemot. Six months later, the Shekhinah returns. Now, there's a whole other share. My time is up. But if you want to understand Kapara, the Korbanot of Yom Kippur, or almost identical to the korbanot of Yom Hashmini. On Yom Hashmini, in, um, in Yom Hashmini, on the day the Mishkan is dedicated, and God Shekinah returns, if you remember chapter 9 in Sefer Vayikra, Vayikra chapter 9, it's the eighth day after the seven days of Miluim, um, God tells Moshe, bring this korbanot, ki ha-yom Hashem nira and they take it, and Moshe tells the people, this is what God commanded, so that God's quote Hashem can appear upon you. What are the, what are the korbanot? Aaron brings a chatat and an ola, and Amisto brings a chatat and ola. Um, Aaron brings an egel, which is a baby par, and an, and an ola, and Bnei Yisrael bring a chatat and ola. And that's what happens in Yom Kippur. Uh, not everything happens here in Yom Kippur, but the, the core idea happens in Yom Kippur. Because in Yom Kippur, we want, we want the Shekhinah to return as well. Now, in a nutshell, what's happening on Yom Kippur? All the Avodah, I'm sorry, let me share my screen one last time. The Kohen Godot is not going in to feed God. God doesn't need the blood of this animal or that animal. That's not the key Avodah of Yom Kippur. The Avodah of Yom Kippur, I'm sorry, let me get to the, here. The Avodah of Yom Kippur is going to be much, much more symbolic. Uh, where did Yom Kippur go? Here we go. 
Um, Aaron is not going in to, to, bring, to bring blood or to, to feed God or God doesn't need the smoke. Rather, he's going in to enter. The very act that Aaron, or the Kohen Gadol, enters the Kodesh Kodeshim is basically saying that we want to be God's people. We want to be back in Har Sinai. We want to be your people. And therefore, the Kohen represents Am Yisrael. The Kodesh Kodeshim represents the top of Har Sinai. And the Kohen Gadol entering saying, we want to be Hashem's people returning to the Mikdash. But because we're not worthy, because we're not Sheoref, we deserve to be punished. And therefore, we want to show God exactly this dialectic where on the one hand, we want to be your people. We're not deserving of it. And therefore, we need protection. I want to claim the word kapara really means protection from the Shekhinah. And therefore, I need to do a ritual of kapara, all these different acts, in order to be able to enter. I'm not entering to bring the korban. I'm bringing the korban in order to enter. Hope that's clear. But the coin doesn't enter. What, what brings what brings our forgiveness and God willing to forgive us is not the fact that we sprinkled blood and brought this animal or that animal, but rather the very fact we want to be God's people, our desire to serve God, but recognizing our weakness, but wanting to do better. That's that's what this is representing. And therefore, I'll just being the last line. Um, you know, we sprinkle all the blood. Everything's on the kaporet. We'll see. Um, remember, visa la kaporet, vifnei kaporet. Then listen, v'chipera la kodesh, 1616 in Vayikra. V'chipera la kodesh b'tumot b'nei Yisrael. V'chipera la kodesh b'tumot b'nei Yisrael. V'chipera la kodesh See this idea, hashokheni tam b'toch tumatam. God dwells with us even though we're tamay. Tumah is caused by sin. And the whole purpose of the kapara on Yom Kippur is basically to show God that even though we're not worthy, even though we're tamay, we don't want to be Tamei, but our sins, our behavior causes Tuma. God is willing to dwell with us if we recognize that we, we're human, we make mistakes, and we can learn from them. If we recognize and we thank God for the ability to do Tshuva, and the fact He's willing to give us another chance, that He can forgive if we learn from our mistakes, that's what the Yom Kippur Avodah is going to represent. And therefore, we need this idea of Kapara. Now, what the Kaporet goes back to Kapara. The Kaporet, remember, is the, um, here, let me show you the, um, here. the word kapara, first time we have it is with the flood. When we make, we're going back to the flood story, the chafarto, no, the, the waterproofing protector of the aron, of the teva, is kapara. That shows you it's protecting from God's punishment. That's the first time we have the word kapara in Chumash. It's a, um, when Asa brings his, um, when Yaakov tried to protect him, from Esau punishing him, he said, for the nefesh rotzeach, his ransom money, protects you from death penalty. Um, the, uh, the mana is, is a thin cover like frost on the land, forest frost, because it covers the ground. But the main thing is the kaporet, the kaporet, um, which covers the aron, which we do all the avodan, has kruvim on them. And what do the kruvim do? The kruvim protect the way to the archet zachayim. The kruvim are protectors of the place of the shekhinah. It goes back to the Ganadian story. Again, that's a whole different share, but you see all this imagery from the creation stories all go back to understanding what's the meaning of the ritual on Yom Kippur. So when you follow the stories of Chumash carefully and understand the meaning of Kapara and Kaporet and the Kruvim and this idea of Shechina and the theme of Gan Eden and returning to Gan Eden and, and trying to do better, but recognizing your, your weakness, but the fact that God is willing to forgive you, the holiday of Yom Kippur is going to be a day that we celebrate this whole new relationship with God, that God can forgive. We have to be his model nation, but he recognizes that we're human, we're frail. We tend to make mistakes. Our ability to make mistakes, but learn from those mistakes and grow from them, that's going to be the essence of Yom Kippur. And that's why, and this will end with this finally, is the um, the famous El Reita Lanur Shlomash, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, wrong one. Um, this one. When God gives us the I'm sorry, here we go. Um, what do we want? We wanted Yudgimu Midot. Here we are. Um, in Yudgimu Midot, when we ask God, you know, sit on your, you, you can sit on Dina Rachamim, sit on the throne of mercy, and treat each sin as a one time, as a first time offense, my very Rishon Rishon. You instructed us to say the 13 Midot and remember them, remember that covenant today, like you told Moshe Rabbeinu. And we say them based on the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, where 
Rabbi Yochan says, you know, when it says, Vayvor Hashem al-Panav, Rabbi Yochan says, if it wasn't written, you couldn't say such a thing, that um, this the, that God wrapped himself like a shleach tzibor and showed Moshe Rabbeinu how to daven, but listen carefully, what did he tell him? Kozman Shisro Chotim Yasula Fanai Kesed Raza. Then say say this it says do before me in this order of El Rachum Bchanum. What's it mean? It doesn't mean it's not a magic incantation. Say these magic words and you're forgiven, but rather understand them and act that way. No, it's Mahu Rachum Afatar Rachum. If you treat your fellow man with Rachamim, with rach, with if you're a Rachum and Chanum with your fellow man, if you're Osei Chesed. And Rav Chesed, even people don't deserve it. You give Chesed. If you're no Seav on the Fesha, if you're Erech Apaim, then God will be Erech Apaim with you. It's, if you're willing to accept the mistakes of others and forgive them for it and understand that and learn from their actions and learn from your actions, and you can grow from that. If you're able to forgive your fellow man and learn from your mistakes and learn from the good things you do and the bad things you do, if you're able to do that, then God will treat you that way as well. And that's what it means. Yes, do before me in that way. We see it given we don't to remember how we have to behave. And this and the whole idea of Yom Kippur, what I want to claim is, is we're celebrating God's second covenant, the second Luchot, I'm sorry, that include Matarachamim, based on the, the understanding we should be Mitin, but we're worthy. We're what do you call it? We're we have the special opportunity of having Mirataharachamim. And having that special day is going to be um, we're going to dedicate that whole day to that idea because that concept. You know, it's a whole it's a whole way of life. It's a it's a personal relationship with God, of growing religiously, spiritually, in your day to day life, in your interaction with your fellow man. It's how we act as a community, not just as people, as a family, as a community, and as a nation. And hopefully, if we act that way, we can have an effect on on other nations as well. If we become that model nation. And if I want to sort of end with a famous midrash on creation, God wanted to create the world with midat the din, so. I, Rashi and Mitkayim side doesn't last, and had to bring in Mitat Rachamim. That's the nature of creation. Creation is such that things should be right, but they're not, and therefore, without Rachamim, we couldn't exist. But that idea of Rachamim, it's so key, it's so central to our growth and our development that we have a holiday dedicated to that idea. And all the rituals we do, I think, come to highlight those ideas. But you only appreciate those rituals when you understand the stories in Chumash that they relate to. Okay. So we'll stop here. I mentioned earlier before that. Um, you know, that we always bring us here. Sir goes back to Yosef and his brothers and the sin of Sinat Chinam. You know, it's why Dafka do we have to sprinkle the blood of a, of a goat for the sin of Am Yisrael? But if you know Chumash, that's Yosef and his brothers and the whole story of Tshuva. And each little topic that's mentioned is a full shear, which I think we've done before. But that's why I want to show you. Um, those are the main ideas I wanted to get across uh, to understand Yom Kippur. So if you have any questions, I'll stay back and answer questions. You know what you're, you know, you know what you're teaching again? Um, actually, it's on the schedule, but uh, I think it should be a schedule they have. Check. Um, I think he sends it out. We haven't seen a schedule yet. Yeah, there'll be a schedule that they have. I have it somewhere in my email, but I almost forgot about today also. So <laughs> I'm the last one to ask. I have to. My calendar runs. My calendar. Um, I run by my calendar, not the other way around. Okay, sure enough. Good. Uh, anyway, I want to wish everyone a and not just for us, for everybody and. I think, um, you know, with the situation nowadays, I think there's so many examples I could have brought. I purposely didn't, because you can do it on your own, about how these ideas relate to our current crisis and situation. And again, hopefully we can learn from our mistakes, but first you have to ask what our mistakes are. You, know, you can't, without recognizing what we've done wrong, you can't fix what you've done. You can't learn from what you did wrong if you don't understand what you did wrong. But the idea of the blame game, the second everyone right away blaming somebody else instead of taking responsibility on their own, and saying, what can I do better? Not when can someone else do better? I think it all begins there. It's always easy to blame someone else. You can blame the government. You can blame other groups of people and things like that. And it may even be true. But it all begins with every person doing what they can do. Can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah, sure, Phil. Go ahead. Me, my question is, when Hashem Hashem Kilrach and Bukhanan, you made an excellent point, I think, that it's not about saying the words. It's about doing. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, Yasula Fanai. That's what the Gemara says. Hmm? That's what the Gemara. That's how I understand the Gemara. Yasula Fanai uh, should okay. do emulate. Then say yom, didn't say say these words. He says do these words. Mm -hmm. it's like, do the facts, in other words. In other words, it isn't the magic formula.
it's, and it isn't that Moshe is supposed to, to direct this to be done, but it's a basic, it's a basic matter. It's a way of life. It's called so it's they do before me in this order. Got it? Yes, That's why I made a big deal about yes, Sulafanai, because Thank you. It's okay. always it, it sounds like a magic incantation, but it's really the essence of prayer. And, and that's what's totally different than idol worship. Idol worship, prayer has nothing to do with better behavior. There's right. no connection between prayer. You do ritual, you, know, you got to get the, in many ways, Judaism is taught like, at the simple level, it's taught like idol worship of us. You pay the it, idol, but it pays you. Excuse me? I said you pay the idol, and yeah. you'll, you get something for your money. Your money, exactly. So say, say you know, bring the, feed him your firstborn son, feed him, give him an animal, do a rain dance or something, and you get rain. You know, yeah, do it with kavana, but it has nothing to do with good behavior. Chumash is saying it's all based on your behavior, but you have to daven to remember the need of how you have to behave. And there's symbolism in the rituals you're doing. The rituals are transformative. But what do you do with nake, one nake, where the chamem ah, So there's, there's two pirushim. Rashi says, shabim, shabim, which is, oh, I say, yes, he can, not yes, he will. It's God's, God's not saying I will forgive you. I can't forgive you, but mm -hmm. I can. But you have to give him reason for him to forgive you. Is that that the other way? The other person say, "Ben I can't, lo yin can Surely he will. It's ben I can't, lo yin I can It's like you know, ben I can't. Surely he will. It's like he's saying a double, like surely he he can clean away sin. The question, ben I But it's it's ben I as opposed to lo yin by on the first Hebrew. Yes. But you see that you can't miss the parallel between the first he brought in the second and the Midot Rahmim in the second Luchol. I thought that's very powerful. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to send you the, um, I'll send, um, I'll, I, I didn't send you the, um, I forgot to give the, she'll send you the source sheets. Okay, wait, can I send them in the chat now or not? Let me see. Chat. I wouldn't rely, well, you can put oh, the, There's no chat here. No, I, I can't send a file with the chat here. So I'll, I'll give them to the Bachirut and she'll send them out to everybody. Okay. Call to. Okay. Okay. Enough. See, I'm. I'll save your question. Sure.